This is where we're going to head today. Do you remember um, that moment in your life where you had a tremendous insecurity? Remember that moment? Uh, I don't know if you've had them or they're related to this. Maybe they're job related. Uh, you're just, you're, you're nervous because you look around, you're like, man, there's a lot of people that are better than me at this. Maybe it's friendship related. You're always going online to figure out where your friends are at and what they're doing because you think they're out there having fun without you. Uh, maybe it's actually date related. You never ask that person out because you were afraid of rejection. Maybe it's a presentation at work that you shied away from because you just didn't want to be embarrassed. Uh, have you ever gone a job interview and thought this? I just hope they don't find out that I'm a total fraud because you look way better on paper than you really are. Uh, I don't know about you, but um, <clears throat> I'm curious if you never tried out for that team or that opportunity or that gig because you thought, I don't know if I'm good enough. Those are all insecurity based. By the way, if you met a moment of insecurity and you actually hit it head on and you got on the other side, do you remember what got you over that? I mean, maybe for you super spiritual people, you're like, I prayed and God gave me courage and that's fantastic. For others of you, you just jumped on the philosophy, I'm gonna fake it till I make it. You're like, I'm just gonna show up and pretend like I belong here and it worked. And for others of you, <clears throat> you probably drank a little liquid courage, just saying, and that got you over it. But it didn't get you over your insecurities, right? Because we all have them. In each of those areas that I just described, I have these moments of great insecurity. In fact, I have one every week, and it's usually right here on this platform. Because I know this, you all are judging me. Shame on you. How's this message going to be delivered? I hope it's interesting, and I hope he's at least on time. I know what you value. I'm going to go long today just because of that. The reality is this, is I have great insecurities in my world, and so do you, and they show up in the book of Judges. Uh, this hero that we're going to look at today, his name is Gideon, and like most heroes, he has a kryptonite. And the kryptonite is not their enemy. The kryptonite is this, the thing that saps a hero's strength. It robs them. It creates this weakness in them. So Judges chapter 6. Now, here's what you got to understand. The story of Gideon takes three chapters to tell. And so we're going to take a high fly overview of Gideon's story, but we're going to fit it all in this morning. And so here's what I need you to do. Open your Bibles. At the very least, open up your notes, and I threw some scriptures in there because I want you to see some of these. And if you have a pen, grab a pen. I want you to underline a couple things. And if you have a digital Bible and you're looking at that, don't underline, all right? Here's how Gideon's story begins. We run into this cycle, and it's the same cycle of chaos that we started with in the beginning of this series. It's where people do evil in the eyes of God, and God's like, hey, you want to do life without me? Let me show you what it's like. And he turns them over to an enemy, and they have this pain and suffering in their life. And they do what you do in pain and suffering, right? We cry out to God, God, why are you doing this? God, help me. And God sends a judge, a hero, to step into their world. This is where the story starts, chapter 6, verse 1, in this cycle. Here it is. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of their enemy, the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites, they prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Underline this next part. Midian, so impoverished. Underline those two words. So impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. These Midianites were the local terrorists. They didn't look to, to kill the Israelites or drive them out of the land. In fact, they left them alone for a large part of the year so they would rebuild, so they would plant crops, so they would become fruitful. And then in the season, they would move in and decimate everything and steal all of their resources. So what did the Israelites do? They hid in caves. They, they hid in caves they, they put up with abuse. They went to the safe place. What did they call them? Strongholds. They went to go live in a place where they were not designed to live so that they would be 
safe. When it says in verse 6 that Midian so impoverished the Israelites, you know what that word impoverished means? It, it means to be made small. And that's what insecurity does to us. Insecurity causes us to live small. They ran to their strongholds to live in a place that was small. It wasn't the right place. It wasn't where God had designed them to live, but it was a place that they at least felt safe there. One psychologist tells the story of a person who was just living a bad existence. They said, why, why do you just keep doing the same thing and tolerating and putting up with? They're like, I know I live in hell, but at least I know all the street names there. You know what that means? It means that even though we live a bad existence and a life that we don't want to live, we're just so familiar with it and our insecurities drove us there, but we just don't want to change because it's the life that we know. Do you know that as human beings, we have such a tremendous capacity to put up with, to tolerate lives that God didn't want for us. We can endure an awful lot, but it's because of our insecurities. So if you're taking notes, here it is. Insecurities make us live small lives because we focus on our problems. I think insecurity keeps us in smaller social circles, small career goals, small attempts at success, and here it is, small spiritual lives where we don't really grow because we're afraid of joining that community group and, and showing up and them finding out, oh, they're not as spiritual as they appeared to be. Or showing up and trying to ask questions and, and someone going, oh, wow, I, I, that's such an easy question. And it's because of our insecurities that we just live small. Now, here's where insecurity comes from. Two enemies. There's the enemy out there, but there's the enemy in us. Maybe there was someone your, in your life, like a Midianite enemy, an external enemy, that made you feel small, that told you you were worthless, that you would never amount to much. But somewhere inside, the enemy was no longer out there. The enemy came in here, and the enemy is your insecurity and beliefs and the story you tell yourself about your worth and your ability. Gideon, he had both of these enemies. He had the enemy out there, and he had the enemy of insecurity inside him. So God steps on the scene as these people cry out to him, and this is where God starts building their confidence. Look at verse 8. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptian, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but you have not listened to me. Here's how God deals with their insecurity. If you're taking notes, God invites us to put confidence in him by remembering what he has already done for us. Did you hear the word I repeated again? I did this. I delivered you. I rescued you. I saved you. I put you in that place. God reviews everything that he did for their grandparents and for their parents. And then he says this, but you didn't listen to me. I've done all these things for you and for your family. And in order for me to break the insecurity in your life, here's what I want you to do. I want you to remember. By the way, this is why we come to church often. This is why daily we open God's word so we would be reminded who he is. And by the way, I'm just going to give you the key to this story right up front. You want to get over your insecurities? It is not about you understanding how great you are, but it is about understanding how great God is and what he has done and is doing in your life. So God chooses this hero named Gideon. He shows up on the scene in verse 11. It says this, The angel of the Lord came and sat down on this oak at Ophrah and, uh, that belonged to Joash the Ab Abizrite. Close enough. Where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Don't miss this detail in the story. Why is he threshing wheat in a wine press? Threshing wheat. You know what that is, right? They're tossing wheat 
in the air, and it would separate the, the outer shell from the kernel inside. And as you threw it in the air, usually up on top of a hill where the wind could blow by, it would blow the lighter shell away and the kernels would fall to the ground, and you would have nothing but this pure wheat that was very useful to you. But Gideon's not up on a hill where the enemy can see him. He's hiding out, living small in a wine press, doing this so no one can catch him. See, Gideon's living small as well as the entire nation. But that's about to change when this angel shows up. And this is the conversation. When the angel of the Lord appeared, verse 12, to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Gideon replies this way, uh, Pardon me, my Lord. And it might sound sarcastic as I read this. I think that might be Gideon's tone. Uh, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. You see how God tells the story? I did all this for you, and yet you refused. And Gideon goes, really? So where are you now? Here's the problem with insecurity. Insecurity grows when we blame God for our troubles. Insecurity doesn't want to look in the mirror and see that maybe we had something to do with this, our shortcomings, where we're at in our problems today. Insecurity just wants to turn around and say, God, you didn't, and you fill in the blank. Why hasn't God done it already? I mean, if God is so great, why do I still have these unfulfilled desires in my life? God may have been here for my grandparents. He might have shown up for my parents, but he's abandoned me. That's awfully strong language to point the finger at God, but that's where Gideon was at. And truth be told, maybe that's where you're at. And if you're there, it's okay as long as you just don't deny it. If you go, you know what, that's where I'm at. I'm blaming God for stuff. But listen, God is about to invite Gideon to not only change his own life, but to free an entire nation. If you go to verse 14, here's how this reads. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. I want you to picture this for a moment. This angel of the Lord standing Gideon in front of a mirror and declaring his strategy. Can you see Gideon looking at himself in a mirror? And here's his strategy. Mighty warrior, go in the strength that you have and save Israel. <laughs> but there's a problem. Because when Gideon looks in the mirror, he doesn't see a mighty warrior. He sees a tired, beaten down man who lives small. And what does he say? Me? L listen, if you're going to conquer a nation, you need a family of influencers. People who other people will rally around because we're going to need an army. And no one's going to follow my family. My tribe is insignificant. My family is not important. Not only that, but I'm the least in my family. Why would I go do that? Do you hear the sibling rivalry and the comparison happening there in his life? Some of you did because you do it. You go, oh yeah, let me tell you how I was raised. And honestly, maybe you were raised in financial poverty. And there's a ceiling in your mind that says, we never have and we never will. Maybe you were raised with just no one in our family really went to college, and you're like, I'm never going to go to college. Why? Because that's just my family history. Why? I mean, why would you limit yourself to the family that has come before you? Because that's their story, but it doesn't have to be your story. I know that for some of you, you just go, you know what, listen, I, I, I'm born and raised by alcoholics, and it's their fault that I am the way I am, and I'm never... So you're just going to blame them for who you are. Your challenges are connected to where, how you've been raised. But I think for some of us, like Gideon, we look at our family and just go, no, 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 my family is this. Therefore, I can never, really? Because God steps in and says, you're a mighty warrior. And I have an assignment for you. 
See, here's the problem. Insecurity grows when we are self-focused. Gideon looks in the mirror, and all he sees are his weaknesses and his failures because he's focused on himself. Now, here's the temptation in trying to fix insecurity. Parents, you're going to get this. Because at some point in your life, one of your kids was insecure. <laughs> I mean, maybe they were insecure this morning. You went to go drop them off in a classroom, and the kids are like, I don't know about this. And you're like, no, you got this. What do we do in moments of insecurity? We put our kids in front of a mirror, maybe not, maybe figuratively, not literally. And what do we do? We point out all the great qualities they have. No, you're great, you're smart, you're brave, you're courageous, you're strong, you're beautiful and doggone it, people like you, right? And we have all of the best intentions for our kids to build them up and build their self-esteem up. But what if we actually took the Christian approach to building up our kids? I know I just offended some of you, and that's okay. What if we took the Christian approach by actually pointing out that when they look in the mirror, if those kids are believers and Christians, we're asking them, would you take a look at yourself and understand this, that Christ lives in you? That you're just, you're worthy and you're lovable because Christ died for you. That God will always equip you to the thing that he calls you to instead of you just reaching the top of your personal abilities. Because what if our kids look in the mirror and go, oh, I have strengths. Oh, I have good qualities about me. And they set their goals based off of, here's my capacity because these are my strengths. You've just limited what that kid can do. Because when God says, no, 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 I have a different plan for you, they go, no, 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 I don't have those abilities and I don't have those strengths. I think we sometimes do our kids a disservice by trying to build up the strengths in their life and having them focus. Because here's the, the deal. Whether they're looking at their strengths or looking at their weaknesses, they're still focused on themselves. You with me? If we put our kids in front of the mirror and just remind them that Christ lives in them, to empower them, to build up this transformation. Here's God's invitation to Gideon. Here it is. Judges chapter 6, verse 25. Here's what I want you to do. Tear down your father's altar to Baal. Cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height. Gideon's family, they're not following God. They're Baalists. They follow the God of Baal. Their family on their property, they built these Asherah poles as a sign of worship to this God. And God tells Gideon, all right, we're going to do this. I'm going to be with you. Here's my first assignment for you. Go tear down your family's religious system. <laughs> Gideon, he's so insecure. You know what he does? He goes at night, in the middle of the night, with 10 other of his servants and helpers, and he tears it all down. Why? He's afraid of his family. He's afraid what they will think. And the townspeople, they actually come, and they worship there too. So the townspeople, they're all upset, and they're like, who did this? We're going to kill him. And Gideon's dad defends him and says, listen, are, are you going to have to... Inv are you going to fight Baal's uh, fights for him? If Baal's upset about it, let him take care of Gideon. I want us to notice, though, that God gives an invitation to Gideon. He says, this is what you worship right now. I want you to get rid of it so that you don't trust in it. I want you to push it aside, tear it down, and then here's what I want you to do. Just don't tear down the old. I want you to put me in its place. Because, see, God's not just trying to save Gideon. He's trying to save Gideon's family, that they'll all be followers and worshipers of God, the one true God. He's actually trying to save a nation so that that town might go, oh, if Gideon wins this battle, drives out these Midianites, who is the God that Gideon worships? Because we want to worship that God because he's the victor. I'm going to say this. It's in your notes, but God invites us to put confidence in him by tearing down what we trust in and replacing it with God. You are gifted some way. You all have strengths. But can I ask you this question? Is your security and your confidence in just your abilities and your strengths? Because if they are, you've limited yourself. And if you are, you might actually turn out like Gideon because his story doesn't end well. We'll get, we'll get there in just a moment. God's invitation to Gideon, even though he 
tears this down at night. It still stands. Gideon, I want you to go save the nation. Now, what Gideon is most famous for is this. He sets up these tests for God. And you may have heard this story before. Um, he sets up these tests to, to prove if God is with him or not. Verse 17 says this. Gideon says, uh, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that's really you talking to me. So this angel says, go prepare a meal and bring it back. So he prepares this big meal. This is high level, okay? We're not going to give all the details. He sets this meal before this angel. The angel touches it with staff. <laughs> just burns up. Gideon's super impressed, and he's like, okay, if you're going to do that, then, then I'm going I'm to follow you, God. I'm going to trust you that you're going to help me fight these Midianites. Well, Gideon isn't totally convinced, and so he asks for a second sign. Verse 36. If you will save Israel by my hand as you promise, look, I'm going to place wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and the ground is dry, then I'm going to know that you're going to save Israel by my hand, just as you have said. So this is probably one of the famous illustrations that you've heard, like, hey, put out a fleece. Uh, give God a test and see how he answers. And Gideon literally is. He puts out wool on the ground. He goes, God, let it all be dry, but the wool be soaking wet. He gets up in the morning. He wrings out a bowl full of water is what the text says. And you would think, okay, there's two signs. You know that God is with you. Just go to battle, Gideon. Let's go. And he goes, okay, God, forgive me. I, I just need one more sign. Same thing, except the wool needs to be dry and the ground all wet. And the next morning, it's exactly as Gideon requested. I want to make sure that we don't miss this because you might have heard this preached. Like, hey, if you're insecure, if you lack confidence, if you're not sure what the right road is, then test God. Put out a fleece. Do something that is like, hey, God, what direction do I go? Do I go this way? Do I go this way? Let, let me point this out. Gideon's actions are not for, is not a model for us. It's not something that we should be replicating. Gideon's not there going, do I go right or do I go left? God, show me which way. God has said, there's one road in front of you, and it's a battle with the Midianites. And Gideon keeps putting out this fleece or putting God to the test. Why? So he can back out. He doesn't want to move forward. His tests and signs that he's asking from God is not a strength. It's not something that we should do. It's part of Gideon's great insecurities. Here's the truth. Insecurity finds ways to back out of God's plans for us. Have you ever backed out of an interview? Backed out of a challenge? Backed out of a job because it just felt big? Or there was an enemy there? If you're backed out of a relationship, you're like, ah, this is just too challenging. I'm not saying it was the wrong thing to back out. There's some relationships you should back out of, some dating relationships. That don't go there. But I wonder sometimes if our insecurity is just finding ways to say no and trying to find God's approval that he's like, yeah, 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 you're right. I can't use you. Gideon's sign they're not really a model for us, but look at what God does. Go to verse 40. That night, God does so, and only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered with dew. Here, here's what I want you to get. God's super, super patient with Gideon. Gideon is actually so insecure that God's like, I know you've tested me three times. Let me give you one more piece of encouragement. Listen to this. If you go to chapter 7, verse 10, I'm skipping part of this, but chapter 7, verse 10, God says to Gideon, if you're afraid to attack, here's what I want you to do. Go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they're saying. And afterwards, you'll be encouraged to attack the camp. Gideon goes down, sneaks down at night, and he's, he's eavesdropping on these two uh, officials of the army talking, and they had this dream, and one of them interprets the dream. He says, who else could that be? But that dream means that Gideon is going to come in and destroy us. And Gideon hears this, and he's like, Rawr. Here's what I want you to get. In the midst of Gideon's insecurity, God's patience and kindness are more powerful than his insecurities. And I think that's a truth that you should write down because I think it's gonna be true for you too. Listen, if you have insecurities, it doesn't mean that God can't use you and won't use you, but he doesn't want you to remain insecure. God's patience and kindness are more powerful than our insecurities. So I skipped an essential part of the story that we're gonna go back to real quick in chapter seven, verse two. 
The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into your hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. How many men did Gideon have at this moment? 32,000. It's a pretty decent army in that day. You know how many men the Midianites had? At least 120,000, possibly 150,000. And God says, I know you're outnumbered four to one, but you have too many people. Because what does God not want to happen? He doesn't want to bring the victory through Gideon, and they all look at each other and go, we're awesome. And they put their hope in each other, or, or they put their hope in Gideon. So he says, you, you have too many men. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to whittle your group down. God says this, anybody who's afraid, they should go home. And 22,000 of his soldiers leave. God says, you know, uh, you still actually have too many men. He says, take them to the river for a drink. And all those who get down on all fours and start slurping up water, they can go home. And all those who cupped water with their hands and took a drink like that, they stay. And at the end of the day, you know how many soldiers are left? 300. 300 Israelite soldiers with Gideon at the front of this war against 120,000 Midianite soldiers. And now God says, now you're ready, if you trust me. God wants to make sure that he gets the credit for the story. Here's a principle for you. I think God may strip away our false securities. He may strip away our false securities so we learn to rely on him as our source of confidence. There's moments where God sends people into your life that will give you confidence. They believe in you and they cheer you on. And there's going to be moments where they move away, where they quit your workplace, where they move out of town, where they're just no longer there for you. Because God doesn't want you to rely on them. He wants you to rely on Him. If we step out of our insecurity and actually succeed in something, I just wonder, if God gave you victory in the thing you're insecure about, will you look in the mirror and just go, you know what? I am awesome. <laughs> or you go, there's no way. God did this for me. Here's what I want you to see. There's something about insecurity that's a little bit insidious and twisted. It's this. Insecurity actually turns into arrogance when we mistakenly think we won the victory or fail to thank God for the victory. I don't have time to tell you all the details of this story, so uh, I'm almost out of time here. Uh, let me just give you some highlight details. <laughs> they go around the camp, the 300 men, and they have jars, clay jars and torches, and the jars cover the torches, and at the same time in, in the darkness of the night, they all shout and yell, and they break the clay jars and the torches, and they see they're surrounded, and it says that God turned the Midianites against themselves, and they started killing one another, and there's a complete rout of the Midian army. But Gideon's not done. He actually starts chasing them. He pursues these two men. They're the two kings of Midian. And they have 15,000 soldiers with them. And so Gideon and his men, after fighting this battle all day, they're pursuing these two kings. And they get to this town called Succoth. Okay? And he tells the, 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 the townspeople, they say, listen, we need some food. We're exhausted. We're tired. If we're going to win this battle, we have, to, we have to have some nourishment. And the townspeople go, uh, do you already have the two kings? hands bound in custody. And they're like, no, 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 but we're going to go get them. And they're afraid. And they say, until you get them, we're not giving you food because we don't want to be an ally with you because what if they win? They still have more than you. They have 15,000. You have 300. Gideon gets his feelings hurt. So he goes to the next town, Peniel. Same thing happens. They deny him food. Long story short, uh, Gideon succeeds, kills the two kings. They're all defeated. He comes back to the town of Peniel and the town of Succoth, and it, it says this, chapter 8, verse 16. Gideon took the elders of the town and taught the men of Succoth a lesson by punishing them with desert thorns and briars. He also pulled down the tower of Peniel and killed the men of the town. You got your feelings hurt. Someone didn't join your team. 
They weren't your enemy, but they weren't your ally. You know who the people were, the men were of these towns? They were from the tribes of Israel. God's trying to take and save this nation. And Gideon gets his feelings hurt. And he turns from this saving a nation to personal blood revenge because you didn't treat me right. And actually kills fellow Israelites because of it. I want you to notice this. Once God wins the battle for Gideon, three things happen. Number one, God never speaks again in the story. That's significant. Not only that, but Gideon never bows down, drops to a knee, and worships God and gives him thanks. He never credits God with the victory. The third, Gideon's insecurity turns to arrogance. And the arrogance is displayed when he goes, God, I'm not asking your opinion. I'm going to go finish this battle and punish those people who weren't with me along the way. That's arrogance. Insecurity and arrogance, they actually, they're the same because they have the same root. And here's what it is. It's a focus on self. If you're taking notes, write this down. The roots of insecurity and arrogance are the same. It's a focus on self. Insecurity is when we look at ourselves and say, I can't. But arrogance is when we look at ourselves and say, of course I can. Because I'm in charge. But God's invitation is for us to look at him for what he wants and how he will empower us. Let me show you where Gideon's arrogance, his arrogance shows up again. Chapter 8, verse 22, and this is the end of his story. The Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Who saved them? What did they say? You, Gideon. You've saved us. They credit Gideon with the victory. And Gideon could have said, no, 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 it was God. Listen to his words next. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. He gives verbiage to God. He gives God the credit at that moment. But in that same sentence, he switches gears and he says, and then he also said, I do have one request of each of you. Give me an earring from the share of the plunder. And then chapter 8, verse 27 Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. And all Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Dude, that's how Gideon's story ends. Mighty warrior. He takes this gold, and in the end it comes out to 43 pounds of gold, and he fashions this thing, this, this kind of breast plate of a, of a soldier or a priest, and he fashions this and sets it up in his hometown, and all Israel worshiped that. Gideon, you and your family could have had it so different if you just acted on the words that you spoke. No, no, no. The victory was because of God, and you bowed a knee to God to give him thanks and worshiped him, and that he doesn't. Let me wrap this up by showing you that the story of Gideon actually was already preached in the Bible. You know where? It's preached in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Um, in chapter 11 is this story about how all these people of great faith in the Old Testament. It's these stories of all these heroes. And he gets to the end of this list and it says, Hebrews 11.32, and it says, What more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, all judges, who through faith conquered kingdoms. And then it says in verse 39, these were all commended for their faith. This, he, this person, this writer in Hebrews says, let me tell you a great story. These guys are all heroes of the faith. They did great things for God. Gideon is remembered as a hero in the book of Hebrews, but listen, his story starts with great insecurity because he's focused on himself, and it also ends in arrogance because he's still focused on himself. Do you see why I had to do that this morning? In the middle, he does go to battle, and he wins a great battle, but this is the verse I want to land on. Right at the end of chapter 11, chapter 12, verse 1 says this. Therefore, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, like Gideon, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us throw off all of the fatal flaws that these heroes of the faith had. Let's be clear. If you read through the book of Judges, most of these heroes are scoundrels. 
They have major character flaws. But what if Gideon could speak to us today to say, I'm part of the cloud of witnesses, and I'm telling you, don't get tangled up in it. Don't get tangled up with that person that you're looking at in the mirror to think that you are less than something. But please don't forget to give God the credit for your story. He's not going to give you a victory in your life so that you feel good about yourself. He's going to give you a victory in your life so that you trust him and follow him with everything that you have. See, Gideon's story doesn't end well, but ours can. It says this, throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And here it is, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When you look in the mirror, it is not wrong to see your strengths and abilities. It's not wrong to look at yourself and go, these are the great things about me. I think you should do that. But if that's all you see, and you miss the fact that you were created in the image of God and Jesus died on the cross for you, then you've missed it. Our invitation is this, from now until the end, till God calls us home, fix your eyes on Jesus. If you have spiritual insecurity in your life, does God love me? Am I worth it? Your spiritual insecurity is actually a gift to you today. Because the gift is this, it can open your heart to say, here's what God thinks of you. He loves you enough to sacrifice his son's life on a cross. And let your insecurity be driven to the fact that, yeah, you aren't good enough to get yourself into heaven. You never will be. But Jesus made a way for you. And if you're already a follower of Christ, daily fix your eyes on Jesus because it's him that will give you an invitation to your, the next part of your journey. And if you're going to rely on your gifts and abilities alone, I think you may be selling yourself short. It finishes with, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Are you tired and worn out from last year? If you are, fix your eyes on Jesus. Because when you're at the end of your strength and your ability, he's going to step into your world and he will empower you in such a way that you have never known before. But he doesn't just do that. He says this, fix your eyes on me. Let's pray. I want you to bow your heads for just a moment. I know that we're over time, but I will not apologize for that in the least. Because I know that there's some of you right now, maybe this insecurity resonates with you, and my invitation is for you to fix your eyes on Jesus. Turn your life over to him. For some of you, if you're a follower of Christ and you're still dealing with insecurities, listen, he is not inviting you to live small. So ask him, God, what are you inviting me to? Second, maybe some of you, if we're really, really honest, maybe arrogance resonates with you. You've had great success in your life, and you've never given God the credit. You've been the hero of your own story. And maybe it's time to give God thanks and give him credit. So, Lord, here we are. It's so easy for all of us to get off track. Help us, God, to daily fix our eyes on you, to talk to you in prayer, to see you in, our, in your word, and to look for how you're showing up in our lives, and to trust when, the, that when we're tempted to live small that we just won't. God, for all you've done in our lives and for all that you will do, we give you thanks today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.